Well, hello, I'm Father Joe Krupp, and this is Quarantine Catechesis, and I started late today. And it's all my lovely, see, my head does the opposite thing. Uh, it's my lovely research assistant, Kevin's fault. Uh, Alicia's here. You know, I, Alicia so graciously agreed to braid my beard today because uh, in the process of showering last night, nobody told me you don't, sh apparently you, I don't know, apparently you do things different when you have braids. Uh, as you can imagine, I don't have experience with braids. I know, big shock. But anyway, uh, so the braids are gone, see? And Alicia was going to fix that today, but it doesn't happen because my schedule changed because it's been 20 minutes. I'm so happy to see you all here. And what a blessing. I'm just going to kind of hold down the fort a little bit until we get uh, more people here uh, to kind of get it cooking. Um, my glasses broke. Look, this just happened. You know, for a week, I've been asking people, do you have one of those tiny little screwdrivers? And, and people do, but I've never followed up. And now I pay the ultimate price. This is science. But here's a cool thing I did figure out. I can shove it in my beard and it will stay. Look at that. Does that beat the braid? It's like a little cannon. No? <laughs> anyway, so uh, I do have backup glasses. There we are. And uh, I'm so glad to see you all. All right, Bestie, you came in later than usual today. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that out. Oh, Lisa, I miss you too. Uh, uh, I did like the French braids or whatever they were. I don't know what kind of braids are French. Like they didn't, uh, you know, like say, hola, hello, hello, I'm Joe's beard. I come from his face. <laughs> That's my imitation of a French braid. A wee wee braid. Yeah, a wee wee braid. It's it's, braid. That's right. Wee -wee braid. Father Bill actually speaks some French, so, you know, he could help me with the whole French braid. So, anyway, I'm so glad you're all here, and it looks like uh, a, a few of you have checked in, and probably enough for us to get a start, hey? Um, so, let's continue yesterday's talk. Um, and, gosh, a lot of you wrote just lovely messages, and I'm so pleased. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I Thank you. And I'm glad that yesterday helped. I'll be honest, that was hard uh, for my heart, but I felt like it was important. And I feel like the Lord was leading me uh, to go there. So, um, again, a big warm hello to all of you. And know that uh, today I do have my lovely research assistant back. Kevin is here, uh, fresh out of prison. Um, and we're so pleased. You know, a lot of guys who were um, guilty of financial crimes aren't allowed to be business managers at the parish, but I don't have that bias. It just saved us money on salary. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's go through a few things. Uh, first of all, today we're going <laughs> to, I kind of like this. Today we're going to finish death. It's done. Uh, the second thing is tomorrow, Father Ryan Riley, superstar action figure, collar sold separately, will be coming by and we'll get to talk with him. And I'm so excited. I know I say this all the time, but I just think he's amazing. I do. I love that young man. And uh, bless his angel heart. Uh, then on Friday, we're going to go to, this is hard for me to say, Celtic Cove Catholic Bookstore in Oxford. Celtic Cove. I can't say Celtic Cove fast, and I want to. Celtic Cove. Celtic Cove. Did I? Celtic Cove, is she a parishioner? <laughs> With her cousin, Megan. With her cousin, Megan Merkel. Uh, who is not a parishioner. I can't tell you how often like I do think of that. Seriously. that Because the question was, how come she got confirmed and I'm sure I screwed something up? I am. Like my first thought is, okay, there's some chick named Megan and I confirmed her and I shouldn't have. And it's technically, part of that is true. There is a chick named Megan and she was confirmed, but not by me. And she's not Catholic. 
that's wisdom. So what we'll do today is take a look at, uh, you know, we're going to look at what do Catholics believe when we die. Yesterday, we went through a, a lot of how to support, how to pray, even a little bit of what not to say. Um, and uh, I don't know if you saw, we had 12,000 views yesterday. Did you know that? We had 12,000 views yesterday on that video, um, which is just crazy to me because I know me and that, that, ma that many people should not be watching me. <laughs> no? Oh, but like and share them. Yeah, I guess I just shot myself in the foot, didn't I? But <laughs> you know what I mean? I know me and I'm like, guys, I'm not that smart, uh, but I am devastatingly pretty. I, I hear that from a lot of people that I don't hear that ever from. <laughs> Hello, Ella. Father Joe loves you. Okay, so let's launch this. Did I just see Becky? I think I see Becky, our Becky. Can I say that? Becky, Becky Kazmersky? John's cousin, Becky. Yes. 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 Okay, you guys, I got to point this out, all right? My life changed because of Becky Kazmersky. I have so much trouble saying her name. Right, it's a typical Polish name, 75 letters with one vowel and a number. <laughs> She's an audiologist uh, out of Wyoming, Michigan, like Grand, what do you call that place? Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. And I had hearing aids. And when I got them years ago, they told me these are the best ones. When these don't work anymore, you have to look at surgery. And Becky, you see her commenting right there. I visited her, what, two years ago now? And that woman changed my life. Um, new hearing aids uh, that, that helped me. Like, I'm going to cry. Y you don't get it, guys. I don't get to be a priest if I don't have these. I can't hear. I can't understand. Um, and so I want to take a minute and acknowledge her ridiculous generosity and her beautiful help that I can hear. And I can hear pretty clearly. Um, and I... Oh, I owe. So seriously, if any of you have hearing problems, if you've noticed that everybody started mumbling, no, they didn't. Uh, unless they're teenagers, then yes, they're mumbling and you need to like strike them or something. I'm just kidding. You should check with an audiologist. And if you're anywhere near Grand Rapids, I drive two hours to go there because she's awesome. So I'm done going on and on. And uh, I thank the Lord for her. I do. Um, I'm going to get gooey. Isn't that crazy? Like I was to the point where I couldn't hear confessions. And I mean, literally could not hear them. I was taking a gas funnel into the confessional and putting it against the screen. And I would have headaches from trying so hard to hear. I love going to confession. Though. Yeah. And Kevin would come to confession. I didn't really want to hear his crap. So that part was nice. What was it like when you put huh? it in the first time? Oh, ask Becky. I started bawling. I couldn't believe it when they put my hearing aids in for the first time. Um, I cried. I Whoops, someone's texting me. Oh, my bird feeder arrived from Amazon. <laughs> so dad moved in with me, right, about four months ago. And dad loves bird feeders. So I cleared out some bushes that were in front of our house. And I've planted bird feeders, do you say? I don't know. But here's the thing nobody prepared me for with bird feeders, okay? Those poles are expensive, mm -hmm. right? I'm trying to buy poles so you can hang thingers for the Tweeties. They're expensive. The poles are like 20 bucks for one. I'm like, it's a glorified stick. <laughs> with well, the... I thought you were talking about the people from Poland. No, <laughs> poles, I don't mean like people from Poland. Uh, they are not expensive. Uh, they are worth every penny. Okay, so let's get to work. Let's get to work. That's what my brother-in-law from Boston would say. Uh, what do we believe happens when we die? Uh, and there's so many jokes I want to do, but it would be so inappropriate. I'm serious. I think death jokes are the best. Um, You're in the right business. I am in the right business. Except, note to self, uh, making death jokes at a funeral, nah. Hey, everybody, welcome to the funeral. A little hard to hear with all the coffin. <laughs> you know, no, 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 no. That's a rookie mistake. So uh, 
we get uh, from scripture a pretty clear idea of what it looks like when we die. Okay? That the first thing you and I will experience is judgment. Uh, we will stand, in the words of St. John, uh, we will see him face to face. Now, I think I have a way to help us understand judgment. And remember, this is an image. Whenever we talk about God, whenever we talk about the afterlife, we're using human words to describe a process that isn't human. So we're always going to screw it up. And it's one of our biggest challenges. Language cannot get it done. It's impossible. If we could describe God, then we could be God. Uh, so we say things like, God is love. And yes, but not really. What do we, why would we say that? Well, it's simple. Our idea of love is so polluted that it doesn't look anything like real love. But it's the best word we got for whatever God is. Uh, I think our catechism flat out puts it this way. We are, every statement we make about God is more wrong than right, but it's all we got, okay? So when I say love, isn't there a song where they spell love? M-E-T-H-O-D-O-F-L-O-V-E. Oh, uh, Hall and Oates. Oh my gosh. That song, like I'm reaching back into hallowed antiquity. I can't believe, I don't even like that song. Yeah, huh? but you didn't go back to the 60s or... No, no, 60s don't count. They should have never happened. Yeah. We should have had two 50s and jumped right to the 70s. Oh. So anyway, why am I saying this? Because at judgment, we will see, and cowboy up, folks, sheer, unadulterated, unfiltered love. And that's good news but it's also gonna hurt us a bit, okay? Not a bit, it's gonna hurt a lot for a lot of reasons. Uh, we've spent our whole life theoretically pursuing love, but if we've not been humble in our pursuit of understanding love, if we've not grown in our idea of understanding love, God, will not look good to us, okay? So people, you know, and I know it's, I'll be honest, I find it a childish question, but I don't know if it's just because I've heard it too much. I really don't. People are like, well, how can a loving God send someone to hell? Easy, they're not loving, <laughs> right? If you think you've got love, but you don't, when you see it, you're not gonna like it. People in hell don't wanna be there, but the only place they'd want to be less is heaven. And you think, well, that's good news. I'd never choose hell. Well, I wouldn't either. But I also know I have no idea of how deep that love runs. My idea of love is so weak compared to his. Am I making sense here? Okay. So we want to have confidence in that moment of judgment, but the confidence is in Jesus, not in our performance. If we are humble enough to allow God to tell us what love is instead of us bending God to look like our version, we'll be fine. Because it'll look familiar to us. Whenever Jesus describes people at judgment, what the image he always uses is Jesus saying to them, I don't know you. I don't know you. And why? You don't look anything like love to me. <laughs> this is where we get in a lot of trouble in our modern conversations. And I'm going to be blunt. It's relatively new, at least in my experience. That part of what we keep doing is reducing love to the least common denominator. Right? And I got to say, issue aside, that whole love is love thing is creepy as heck. Right? The issue, like when people were using it for homosexual marriage, that was a bad slogan to pick. Because no, there's some forms of love that are awful and destructive and hateful, right? I mean, an abusive guy will tell you he loves his spouse, but he's wrong. And there's some kind of love that we recognize, no, that's not healthy at all. That means you're broken. Nobody would say to someone who desires children that way, hey, man, love's love, right? We gotta be careful when we talk about love. It is the most precious, powerful, valuable, amazing thing. And we need to treat the word even with great dignity and respect. I hope I'm making sense. Yeah. Okay. Question. Hit me. 
it, but in, in the example you gave, is that love or lust? I mean, when you right. have an attraction to children or right. sex, is that lust or love? And that's what I mean, yeah. right? Because that's what we do. We open up the word love to our definition instead of embracing his. We say, well, how do I know what his is? Um, his words. He told us. Look, it's in the Bible, right? Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. And we do. We reduce love to companionship by accident. We reduce love to lust, probably not by accident. We reduce love to our self-interest. I love how you make me feel. Wow, you just made it all about you. Right? Which is not love. I hope this is making sense. That's why we need to have a healthy respect for judgment. We call this the fear of God. And people are like, why shouldn't be afraid of God? Yes, you should. Not because he's awful, but because we're awful. <laughs> right? I mean, I love you, and I believe you love me. That's not what But we recognize, holy crap, I'm flawed. I can't tell you how many times at the end of the day I'm like, shoot, I stuck me into something. Why? Ego. Pride. Self-obsession. That's not love. Right? Now, I never do that because you know we were at a meet. No, I shouldn't tell that story. Oh, I want to tell you a story. I really want to. I'm not gonna. Well, look what you did to them. Yeah. What did I do to them? Well, I love you. Know. you. Tease them. Well, you know, why don't you just say, hey, hey, why don't you say, rest of the story at 10? <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me think of how I can do this there without. All right, wait, July 2 oh, hot dog stand. I don't know what that means. I love hot dogs. Okay, so this was like two parishes ago. And we were at a meeting and we were trying to figure out, we had to order these books, but these books were expensive, okay? And so the associate wanted one. But I was like, no, we need to share these because these are expensive, right? These books are crazy expensive and it's God's people's money and we can share and blah, blah, blah. So we're figuring out who gets what, right? Who gets which book? And the associate was like, I said to him, well, I'll share mine with you, okay? And, and, but as the meeting progressed, he wouldn't, no. I want a book. I really want, bro, why do you have to have a book? And ready? Quote, I'm a priest. And it was such an insightful, in the worst way moment, where like the whole room looked at him and went, you got issues, pal. And he couldn't see it. He couldn't see. To the point that the next day, when I tried to talk to him about it, you know what he thought I was talking to him about? To affirm him. Okay? We all have that crap. I would tell you mine, but I don't know what it is. Right? But we've all got those things. Um, and they're in us. It just, I don't know. I hope I'm making sense. So when we talk about judgment, this is what fear of the Lord is. It's like, I'm doing my best, but I'm a train wreck. And as long as we can say that and actually believe it, we got a real good shot here. Because you can only get to heaven one way, Jesus. You can't earn it. It's a gift. It's a gift. And we practice receiving the gift. So at judgment, we'll either recognize love and love it, or we'll see it and we'll hate it. Okay? So in the end, that's what we're talking about with judgment. And it results in one of two destinations. Okay, heaven or hell? Okay, heaven or hell? Would I like help? Uh, hey, Laura, what, what, I, what do you think? I'm, she's gonna help me with something. She's, my sister Lori is a wonderful, has a wonderful gift for imagery. I don't know, anyway, I could go on and on. But yeah, of course, Lori, any, any help. Uh, so there's two destinations, heaven and hell. So let's look at hell. What is hell? Uh, hell is uh, isolation. Huh? Oh, figure me <laughs> No, Lori, I did receive that 10-page document you sent me with the helpful footnotes. The illustrations were a bit over the top. All right, Miriam. Miriam's awesome. I know her. Okay. Actually, no, don't tell that story. So, hell, what do we got? You've got a ton of images in scripture about Gehenna, but we want to be careful. It's a fairly common mistake. 
Uh, if you look at Dante, which is one of the older descriptions of hell, hell's cold, heaven's hot, okay? And we can get into that. We will get into that um, when we get to heaven, okay? Uh, when, we, <laughs> when we cover heaven. I don't know if you people are going to make the cut. But hell, any image you see, please remember it's an image, okay? It's an image, and it's not an actual photograph, in a sense. What we know is that hell will be that condition of utter separation and isolation. That's a great way to think of it, okay? In terms of heaven, uh, I encourage you, and I believe what I'm going to say is, is a good way to put it, okay? And if you hear someone say something different, they're probably right, okay? Try not to think as purgatory of purgatory as separate from heaven, Try to think of it as the experience of heaven. And I'm going to walk us through that, okay? Uh, and hopefully this will help you understand Perg a little more. Because too often, what we envision is this place of grotesqueries and torture that if you make it through, you get to go to heaven. And that's not what we're talking about. What we do when we hear these uh, descriptions of purgatory from the Middle Ages, we have to remember they're talking to Middle Age people. Okay, Middle Ages people. They're using images that worked for them. And truly, if you look at Europe in the Middle Ages, they understood torture <laughs> in the worst possible way. So if you wanted to say to someone, it won't be pleasant, that was a good image to use. So with that, what I want us to start with is this idea that God's presence is a fire, okay? a purifying fire. Um, if you look at the angels that are described as, excuse the phrase, geographically closest to God, they're called seraphim, right? You've all heard that phrase. And that's a word that means the little fiery ones, okay? That they're, again, we're using human imagery to describe a non-human thing. They're so close to God that his fire is them. They are his fire, when you and I emerge from the womb of earth into heaven, the first experience is going to be a bit challenging because that fire purifies, okay? That pi fire purifies and is it cauterizes. We are emerging from the battle of earth and in that battle, we've accumulated scars and we've given scars and those scars need to be healed. And all the impurities are burned away by this blessed fire. If you look at Dante's image of purgatory, nobody in purgatory is unhappy, right? They're happy because are they experiencing a pain? Yes, they're experiencing a transitory pain so that they can enjoy the eternal perfectly. Is this making sense? Okay. I hope this helps. Because as you move through purgatory and closer to the fire, it's not that you're changing geography. It's that your experience is changing as you adapt more and more to the reality you're seeing. Think of it like you sitting in a room with your eyes wide open and it's pitch black and someone turns on the lights. The first thing is your sensory overload, truly, and then your pupils shrink down to nothing. But that microsecond is extremely unpleasant. That's an image of purgatory. Okay. Um... So we covered hell and purgatory already. I hope you find this helpful. And now let's look at heaven. Uh, what do we know about heaven? Not much. When I was a kid, I'll never forget. Seriously, this is, I'm going to hell for this, right? This is one of the many reasons. I remember thinking that heaven was church all day. And I was like, I, 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 I don't want that. Right? <laughs> That's a, I just assumed heaven was every day walking into church and staying there all day. And my experience of church was far from the experience of heaven, especially when you're a little squeaker and it's like, there's baseball that could be played right now. Church was the thing you had to do, right? 
So with that, heaven, whatever heaven is, every time Jesus talks about it, it rocks. That there's no more pain, that there's no more sorrow, that the old has passed away. We join God outside of time. Now, we're going to hit in a second who has, oh, Melissa Jablonski. Love that woman. I hope you're watching, Melissa. I love you. She is one of the most generous hearted. I could go on and on, okay? But here's what you need to know about Melissa. She is an encourager. You know what I mean? And that's a rare thing. Uh, I, yeah, I love Melissa. Okay, so she asked a question about when I'm born, does God know where I'm going? Does God know how I'm going to die? Uh, so this is going to tie into that as I try to explain the timelessness of heaven. Now, I believe that was my first topic on Quarantine Catechesis. Does that sound right to you? If you haven't seen it, and if this doesn't sound self-serving, uh, if you go back to, was it my first one? Time and Trinity. Time and Trinity. I did a whole hour. Okay. Now the first 10, 15 minutes are me saying hi to everyone because I couldn't believe this was working. Uh, and I try to explain as best I can uh, the how God experiences time. And I'm going to do a hyper quick review of it right now. Okay. Uh, and if you want more detail, I do recommend that. I think it went well. I really do. Um, and it's a hard thing to describe. So let's see what we got. You and I exist in linear time, and we can't exist in any other. There is no other possibility. You know, like if we ever invent a time machine, for example, we can't go all the way back in time. The farthest in time we could go back is to the moment that machine was made, right? That's how it works, okay? That's how time works. Why? Because we're locked into linear time. And what is linear time? A constant forward motion, okay? A constant forward motion. We can't stop time. We can't hurry time. We can't go back in time. All we can do is move forward. So you and I, the image I always use, stick with me here, is we experience time like a scroll that unfolds. We don't know what's next. We're, oh, this is a bill. Would you guys like to, let me see, what's this one for? What? Well, this is for my new Roman Missile. So if you experience time as the unfolding, then you can't see, quote, the end of this. Like you can't see if with this, gosh darn it, I stink at this. What you can't see is what's next until you get there. That's how you and I experience time. How does God experience it? Well, like that. It's all right there. Okay? He is and has to be outside of linear time. Oh gosh, we could get into this, but go back to the first lecture. Just, if you don't mind, trust me. <laughs> when I say in the first lecture, I attempted to prove that he has to exist outside of linear time or he's not God, okay? So if God is outside of linear time, then there is no such thing as before or after for him. It's all right there. As God sees time, uh, Jesus hasn't been, the world hasn't been created yet, and the world's ended, and everything in between, it's all right there to him. With that, does God know what I'm going to do next? No, he's already there. He knows I already did it. Okay? There's two factors you've got to think of here. If he's outside of linear time, my freedom doesn't change at all. I'm free to do A or B. It's just he can already see what I did that I haven't done. <laughs> yeah? When Jesus said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times, he didn't say it because he knew Peter would do it. He said it because Peter had already done it. He wasn't limiting Peter's freedom in the slightest. He was simply describing what he could see. Okay? That's how it works. And you are free to change it but you won't experience it as a change. Because for you, it's unfolding. For God, it's done. Wow, this is tough. If you get a chance, again, I feel bad saying it because it feels self-serving. But go back to that first one I did called Time and Trinity. Um, and uh, 
know that uh, I think I do a better job explaining it. Just note that when God appeared to Moses and Moses asked his name, God didn't use bad grammar. He simply described himself as outside of time. I am who am. Okay. So I hope that helps with does God know when we are going to be born and die and how? Yeah, but not because you aren't free, but because he's outside of your time. You experience it as not having happened yet. He experienced it as he sees the, yeah. <sighs> Whew. That's hard to do in a short amount of time. It's actually easier if I have an hour. So when you and I die, we'll have our personal judgment. And that personal judgment will result in heaven or hell. Okay? What about those who don't die? Right? What about those who are alive when Jesus returns? That's when you get to what we call, uh, what do we call it? The general judgment that Jesus talks about in Matthew, where he's going to separate the sheep, where God's sep <laughs> where God separates the sheep from the goats. Remember that passage? That's what that puppy's going to look like. It's the same reality, but kind of done in group. Okay, um, and at that point, a couple things happen. First, for those of us who may or may not die before Jesus returns. Our bodies go on the ground, our souls go to judgment. When Jesus returns, our bodies will be raised up. For those of us in heaven, if we make that cut, our bodies will be raised up, scripture says, and restored to us in our glorified form. So we will once again be body, soul, unities, but heaven will descend and be on the earth and the earth will return to being the way God intended it. Okay. You and us, us, perfectly one with him. How cool is that? Uh, so a lot that you'll see in our funeral ritual kind of breaks this down for you. And one of the wonders of the funeral ritual, a lot of it, uh, a lot of the wonders of the funeral ritual gets lost just because we're there in grief. You know, and, and I get it. That's not a condemnation, sweet Lord. Uh, but I do want to share, a, I want to walk us through a funeral, okay? Um, with some ideas, if I may. A couple, I know I've talked about this before. I'm going to harp on it a little bit again. I get it that we call funerals a celebration of life. That's how Americans talk. I get that. But I, I don't encourage it because it is a funeral. Someone has died and we're sad, right? Sometimes I worry that we do a little bit of denial here or pretend, try to do some level of denial. We wanna remember that as far as Catholics are concerned, the funeral's happening for a couple reasons, but the first one is to pray for the dead. We pray for the dead. We are praying for them more than we are celebrating them. It's important to remember. Uh, this is a huge part of our faith, and the Jews did it, and we do it. And again, just to be clear, and I'm a little defensive on this, this idea was unchallenged in 2,000 years of Christianity. It's just the last four or 500 years where we decided, no, you're not supposed to pray to the dead, for the dead. Right? That's brand new. In a 2,000-year-old church, 400 years ain't much. Uh, but boy, it's really infected Christianity. You know, why do you pray for the dead? Because uh, it says to in scripture. Because, you know, when John in Revelations was given a vision of heaven, what was everyone in heaven doing? Quote, receiving the prayers of people on earth and giving them to the Lord. What do you do? Call John up. Sorry, pal, you were wrong. Your vision of heaven stinks. Your vision of heaven really stinks. That'd be my David Putty voice. Gotta support the team. Feels like an Arby's night. Um, so why are we talking about this? Where do we go? Oh, so let's walk through the funeral ritual, okay? Uh, first of all, what if you choose to be cremated? No problem. 
uh, the church has the funeral right for cremation. I, I can show you. And there will be people, like for my mom, her whole life, she was told Catholics don't get cremated. Well, the American church changed the rule in the late 90s, 1990s. Why? Because Americans changed a little bit, and we can talk through that. Okay? But if you look at this, um, I don't know what you can see. See, it says with cremation, right? And that's the Catholic ritual book. So it's legit, you know, not to be funny, but I tell people, I show people, because some get really worried. This is the Catholic ritual that we use for funerals, okay? Um, and on there is a whole ritual for cremation. Why did the church tell Americans in particular, and I think only, believe it or not, you can't be cremated until the late 90s? Well, because what they found was Americans were a little bit infected with a non-Catholic idea. And you ready for it? It's that our bodies are shells. Ugh, okay? We let it creep in there. And that's an awful, awful, awful thing. Because they're not just shells. God took this stuff on. God made it. It's good. And in Revelations, we're told it's going to heaven. Or hell, one day. Okay? Our bodies are sacred. They are created for our souls. Okay? And, and we need to remember that. So what they found was American Catholics, oh, sorry, were opting for cremation because they were like, oh, the body's just a shell. Yikes, that's a heresy, right? And I know no one, you know, most people, oh, um, sorry, woof, my hearing, uh, my, my tinnitus just kicked in. I haven't had that in forever. Woo, that's a good one. Um, Sorry, guys, hold on. Okay. Whew. That's a spicy meatball, I gotta tell you. All of a sudden, your ear just starts this really high pitched screech. And I used to have it all the time till I got these glorious hearing aids that it just kicked in, but now it's gone. Okay. It's because Carrie punched me in the head. Pray for me. What were we talking about? Cremation, okay? So what they started to realize, and I don't know what way they determined this, but at some point they decided, okay, Americans weren't over that. Americans were kind of over that idea that, oh, we cremate because the body's just a shell. No, no, no. It's uh, sacred. God died for that. And God took it on, okay? So if you choose to be cremated, the church does ask that if you would, you do the you bring the body to the funeral before you cremate it. You don't have to, but it is the preference. Let's see, can a Catholic priest officiate? Yeah, it depends. Uh, I've done a lot of non-Catholic funerals, usually for like, frankly, abandoned people, right? Uh, um, in uh, Lansing, I would get calls from the police, a homeless guy, and it was just me and the cops would always come, bless their hearts. And just be me and some cops and the dead guy. And we didn't know if he was Catholic or not. Uh, um, yeah, uh, we can do those. And some states don't allow it and some do, but the church allows it. And if the priest says they can't do it, it's because they're being a jerk. <laughs> Who said that? Where did that come from? I can't tell you how many people tell me these awful stories of calling a parish for help. Are you a registered parishioner? If that's your church's first question, you need a new church. That's a mess. Huh? <laughs> oh, am I gonna get killed for this? No. Yeah, there are things my priest friends might be like, Joe, I have to kill you now, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, in fact, when I was in Hudson, one of the lovely things we would do, I loved this, and if we had masses here, we would, but we're just packed. We would literally check the paper every day. You wouldn't believe, and you know what? Let me throw this out there. This might help you all. You won't believe how many people the second mom or dad dies, won't have a funeral mass. They're too busy. Oh, they wouldn't want all the fuss. Trust me, they want it now. Right? Can you? It, don't make that call for your parents, especially if it's just out of convenience. That's awful. Okay, we pray for the dead. That's what we do. That's how we roll. And we would go through the paper and find these beautiful people who had been to church every day for 500 years whose kids went, eh. So we would do a funeral without the body, right? Oh, pray for the dead, right? Pray for the, anyway, blah, blah, blah. 
So if you choose to get cremated, the church's preference is that you bring the body to church and cremate it afterward. You don't have to. Just for us, it's a better symbol. And what happens in this ritual? Well, uh, we do, if the church physical structure allows it, you try to start the funeral at the door to the church. Why? Because that's usually, like when churches were built classically before the recavations of the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, churches were built with an idea that when you walk in the door, there's the baptismal font right there. Why? Because that's the entrance to the church, okay? Spiritually and literally. So you would start the funeral back there. Why? Because the funeral is the continuation of the baptism. This is smoking, right? That's why the funeral ritual used to not start with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the same way that the baptismal ritual didn't end with it. Okay? Why? Because it's a continuation. One started the covenant, one completed it. How tight is that? And here's how we back that up. The first thing you do then at the funeral, you scoop holy water from the baptismal font and you put it on the casket. I like to scoop and pour, but it freaks people out and makes a mess on the floor. It's a facilities issue. It's a facilities yeah. issue. And we have a very strict director. And our, our, our business manager is a horrible, horrible <laughs> human being. The second thing we do we cover their casket in white. Why? Because right after we poured holy water on them when they were little squeakers, we put a white garment on them and said, uh, Child, you have been clothed in Christ. See in this outward white garment the inward sign of your Christian dignity with your family and friends to help you bring that dignity unstained to the kingdom of heaven. So we say that at their baptism while we wrap them in white, so then we wrap their casket in white. Okay? Then... Uh, let me think it through. Then we got the candle, okay? So there's this Paschal candle we light at baptisms. We light it then at the funeral as well. All of this is at the entryway to the church to remind everyone that the reason we have hope now is because of what happened to the day of their baptism. God entered a covenant and he doesn't change his mind, right? How clear can we be on this? Well, while we were killing him, he was saving us. Dang. Our God rocks. Then we process forward, usually to a song, and he will raise you up <laughs> on eagle's wings. Every funeral. <laughs> then uh, we go forward and we start reading scripture, man. That's what we do. It, it, it's amazing to me uh, that we get a bad rap about scriptures as Catholics. And on one level, I get it. We're, we're a weird tribe, okay? But on another, if you go to church every day for a year, you've heard most of the Bible, right? Uh, why? Because we read from the Old Testament, and then we read a psalm or sing it, uh, and it's always shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, beyond my needs, from death into life. I have sang that psalm 9,215 times last week. That's how good it is. It's that good. Oh, yeah, you're getting no argument from me, right? As it turns out, God's quite a writer. Yeah. <laughs> it would be awesome, seriously, if, like, we worship our Lord and we love him, but it turns out he's kind of a bad writer. I make shepherding good. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Think of this. Guys, we could have a scripture, you know, and it turns out God's just not a good writer, and that would be so cool. God makes shepherd gooding. <laughs> Laying down with green happiness. My soul gets restored. I'm sorry. I'm tired. I didn't sleep last night. Okay. At 1.30 a.m., I gave up. I'm serious. I thought, I'm not going to sleep. So I went out and I ate a big bowl of cereal, thinking the milk will help. Oh, yeah. It yeah. doesn't. No, it doesn't. I, I, didn't milk used to help when we were kids? Heated. Heated. I don't want to eat hot cereal. You know, no. No. So anyway, at 4 a.m., finally, I felt myself like slipping into to sleep. And then, of course, the alarm goes off an hour and 40 minutes later. And I said something to the Lord. Okay. So anyway, we process him. We hear the Old Testament. We sing a psalm. We read from the New Testament. Then we read a gospel. And then the priest preaches. 
The way I do funeral homilies, the focus is, of course, not on the deceased as much as it's on Jesus, because Jesus is the one who gets us home. We can't earn heaven. Write it down. We can't earn heaven. It doesn't matter how good we think we are until we can be perfect and dying on a cross, forgiving your enemies, you can't earn heaven. But I do try to use the life of the deceased to give a clue or a hint as to their connection to Christ. So at my last parish, I got to tell you, I don't know if I ever told you this, the place where we cooked the funeral lunch, because Catholics eat after funerals. It's what we do. Do Protestants do this? I don't know. Um, uh, well, actually, I got. I know Lutherans do. I got some buddies who are Lutherans, and they eat after funerals. I just figure it's a German thing. We love death and food. Who knew? But so you'd be sitting there praying this solemn, dignified, sad funeral, and you could smell roasted chicken, ham, potatoes, cheesy potatoes, not just potatoes, cheesy potatoes. <laughs> And it was, you'd sit there and you're trying to think about Jesus and, and, and the dead person. And all you're thinking is, when this is done, we eat. And I always use that in my head as an image, actually, of what a good funeral homily does. It reminds people of what's cooking. It tells you, look at their life and smell Jesus in there. And that's part of why we hope. They were clearly connected to Christ. Christ is the only way to heaven. Woohoo! So after that, Mass kind of goes as normal. Sunday Mass. Italians. <laughs> Mike. Um. Oh, yeah, Heather. Oh, ham buns. Mm. Anyway, uh, so then we, we do the Mass as normal. We receive the Eucharist, and then... When that's done, we sing a very, or we say a very ancient prayer, one of the oldest ones we've got. Uh, in paradisum de tu cant angile. May the angels, how does this go? May the angels welcome you to paradise. May the martyrs welcome you as you arrive. May you see the face of the Lord this day. Alleluia, alleluia. Okay, we'll say it in Latin or in English. Oh, it depends, right? It depends on what the family wants. And then the priest says a prayer of commendation. Let me see. Oh, and of course my brain froze up. Uh, oh, I got the book. I got the book. If I can just get the first line. Um, un momentito, por favor. That's Spanish. Uh, it's somewhere in here. There it is. Huh? Oh, there it is. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we can... Mend the soul of our brother in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, they will rise on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings that you bestowed upon them in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of their fellowship with the saints. Merciful Lord, turn toward us. Listen to our prayers. Open the gates of heaven to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we are with you and our brother forever. How tight is that? And then if there's a burial right after, we head off to the burial, and then then it's ham. Yeah, who was it? I think it was Kierkegaard who said, this is the end of the most illustrious life ever lived on earth. You are buried. <laughs> it was like, it's a great point. Right? No matter who you are, no matter how powerful and rich and illustrious, what a great word you, you, you know, you're still going to end up the same as dirt poor jerks or dirt poor saints. It's kind of wild. I remember in high school here in a, what was it? It was a, one of our class, I guess it was eighth grade. In eighth grade, one of my classmates died. Uh, of all things, ready for this? And I don't know, right? You're in eighth grade, so who knows what's real? Right, but what was got to us was it was a tonsillectomy that went south. Hmm. Isn't that nuts? But the pastor, the, the line of the homily, it was basically his whole thing was, you're all going to die. It was like eighth grade, like, dude, that's heavy. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, let's see, how are we doing? Yep. I feel like this one isn't as, uh, well, we're talking about death. How fun can it be? I mean, I can have fun with it, but I don't know, you know. Was that seventh grade, Scott? There's my boy, Scott. So right there, I think I pointed him out to you guys before. Scott Putney was my best friend growing up. It just, yeah. Ah, I could go on and on. Hey, and we, we've been finding out lately, I don't think, I think we agree on five things politically, and we probably, there it is. Sorry, lost my connection. Is it back? Is it back? Is it, if you're, yeah, if, can y'all, okay. Yep. Can you see my pretty, pretty face and hear my delicate, flowery voice? Right, Scott, wouldn't you say, I think we like agree on five and disagree on five, and it's kind of fun. I don't argue politics with anyone but him, because he's fun. He actually knows what he's talking about. It's weird. So, yeah, I don't know. I made the number up. But every time I think we're arguing, then we get to this point where I'm like, well, yeah, I believe that. So anyway. Okay. Okay, so a question about limbo. Okay, here's the, oh my gosh, Chris Hazleton. Scott, Chris Hazleton's here. My, just too Beautiful man, I'm so blessed to know. And by the way, I think I've shared this with you before. Chris uh, serves as a police officer. I think he's getting ready to retire. But look, whatever's going on in our country, and it's a lot, I served for seven years with the East Lansing Police, okay? It's tough. And we need to remember the way we talk about police officers, I don't know. In fact, I'm gonna break topic. Is that, is that okay, guys? Because for like guys like Chris, I want you to know this. Because um, I don't know if, I don't wanna make this cops against black people or black people against cops or any of that. I just want to remind us that everything in our country tells us we have to pick one extreme or another. And that's never where virtue is found. St. Thomas Aquinas said, virtue is the appropriate distance between the two extremes. Isn't that beautiful? And this is why our culture isn't virtuous. Because you're told you have to either hate cops or worship them. They are all saints or they're all demons. But what they are is human beings who we constantly ask into the worst situations possible and say, fix this, and then we're shocked that they're damaged. Right? True story. My first night on duty, and I will never forget this. We get a call, and I'm riding with someone because I'm getting trained, okay? And we roll up, and there's a fight. And I remember super clearly thinking, those two kids don't know how to fight, right? These were college kids It was MSU and they were just, you know, throwing haymakers and, you know, blind windmill kung fu. And um, so we get in there and tackle these cats and we, we handcuff them, okay? So one goes in one car and one gets in our car. And we're driving to the station. It was only about a three, four minute drive, okay? Because this is how genius these boys were. A, we're going to fight and we have no idea how to fight. Uh, B, let's do it real close to a police station. Why not? So as we're driving this kid, he starts with this. With this and I, I promise this is true. I am not exaggerating. What are you guys doing? What's going on? And I look back and I was, dude, you were fighting. I wasn't fighting. And for the next three minutes, he convinced me he wasn't fighting. Dude, I don't know what you guys think you saw. I swear to God. I swear to God. And he kept saying he was just shocked. And I'm sitting there, and I started to say something. And the guy who was driving, I don't want to say his name, so I don't know what. He put his hand on my knee and just basically gave me the, dude, shut up. By the time we got to the station, I was convinced that I saw something that didn't happen. Because this kid was so convincing. And like literally crying, yeah. like, you guys, I would never, what do you, I don't understand. You got the wrong guy. You got blah, blah, blah. And so we take him in, they do all the stuff. We come out and the, uh, call him Bob, Bob the cop sits down, starts touching through the screen and says, watch. And it was the dash cam. And it was them, them fighting when we pulled up. 
And I, my gosh, I'm going to get emotional. This is what he said. Joe, you're a good guy. And this job will break you. Everybody lies. Nobody takes responsibility anymore. And if you can't handle that, you need to get, you need to deal with that now. Everybody will lie to you. That's what he said. Isn't that something? Can you imagine the, can you imagine what he went through to get to that point? Because I'll tell you this, his wife was a cop and she got shot on duty, breaking up a fight between a married couple. I don't want to canonize police. And almost every cop you talk to, if he feels he's safe with you, he'll tell you they all get it. Oh yeah, we got a lot to work on. But man, guys, just be careful how we talk about those men and women um, and pray for them. And again, please, please, please don't make this an either or. If you, can, if you can't hear this without thinking, well, cops and blah, 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 then just watch something else. We don't play that game here. We don't play the game that you have to be one extreme or the other. We don't play that here. But I want to be clear that in my seven years, I was so proud of these men and women and the sheer volume of verbal abuse they took eight hours a day for doing the job we pay them to do. And they, like I always say this about corrections officers, if we went a week without corrections officers, we would fall into chaos. If we go a week without cops, we will fall into chaos. Do police departments need to be reformed? Of course. Everything needs to be reformed. We're all a mess. The church needs reform. I need reform. Well, I don't. I need reform. You need reform. We all need reform. But if reform is, we hate all of you, you're all the same way, then just watch something else. I love you, but I don't play that game. And I praise God every day for those men and women. And their marriages don't survive it, right? Their personal lives don't survive it. They don't do it for glory or thrills, okay? They do it because it's their calling from Jesus. And they're faulty just like the rest of us but they want to go home. Ah, all right. So that's what I got. Sorry, Chris, I don't even know if you're still listening, but I love you, I'm proud of you. I'm proud to call myself your classmate. And I thank you, you have a savage job. And you, ah. So, uh, well, that pretty much shot the whole funeral thing. <laughs> And it's probably going to be my funeral because somebody will take this clip and butcher it and send it out, you know. Father Joe hates people. Well, and I always say, look, I hate all people. Yeah, yeah you're not, you're not discriminating. Andy Ortiz, oh my gosh, I miss you, bro. I thought I was going to get to see him the other day. I had to cancel a meeting. I love that dude. All right. So guys, I'm sorry, I hope that didn't, I, I don't wanna drag politics into this, I don't. It's just, I see Chris, I know what a beautiful heart he has. And I know a lot of cops. And I know there's some bad ones, trust me. And cops know there's bad cops, they're under no illusions. And there's some way we can do this. But as long as we let the shrieking extremists define us on the right and the left, we will lose our mind. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. The crazy people decide way too much in this country because the rest of us feel like, well, we got to pick the other crazy. Ugh. So pray for our cops. Pray for people who are victims of police misconduct and know this, police are praying for them too. Right? Pray for corrections officers. I hate that no one cares about them. I do, I hate that. They do so much for us. And in my last parish, I can't tell you how many COs I had and what beautiful, hardcore men and women they are. I met men who are crippled for life for their work in the prison system and no one cares. I care. Yeah, all right. So thank you, thank you, Chris. 
Um, so I'll shut up now. I went over and I hate that I dragged this in there, but I, I felt like it was the right thing to do. I hope you found this helpful information on funerals. And tomorrow when Dr. Dr. Ryan Riley. Okay, guys, from now on, we're going to refer to Father Ryan as Dr. Ryan. That will tick him off. <laughs> And this is right. It's like when they made Monsignor Bernie Riley, for any of you who know him in the Lansing, the most humble and beautiful priest in the world, when they made him a Monsignor, he was actually irritated. And so, of course, you know what we do? We call him Monsignor, like all the time. <laughs> Drives him nuts. I just want to be a priest. Yes, Monsignor. That's what I do. Poor guy. All right, so let's do this. Let's say a prayer. Today was more serious. I'm sorry, but... Uh, I don't know if I mentioned I didn't sleep last night, but I did have a bowl of cereal. Uh, what do you call those? Crunchy almond? Did it have sugar in it? I don't think so. It was like some kind of healthy crap. Uh, nut, almond, delight, crunch, communism thing. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, Father Dr. Ryan Riley. Monsignor. Monsignor. In Eterna. And then on Friday, the Celtic Cove Catholic Bookstore. Woo! I said it right. And I didn't even look at my paper. So I will give you guys a prayer and then a aida. And then I will see you tomorrow at noon. And just thanks for always watching. It means a lot. I do love Captain Crunch, particularly peanut butter Captain Crunch. Ooh. Yes. What? It up the roof of your mouth. Oh, it does. Oh. It shreds the roof of your mouth. But that is a oh. price I gladly pay. Oh. And here's what you do. Ready with peanut butter Captain Crunch. You put a scoop of vanilla ice cream in the blender. <laughs> yeah. You take uh, uh, the peanut butter Captain Crunch and you pour it in there. And then you add some milk and you grind it up. Zzz, rough. That's a spicy meatball. I'd add bacon if I could. Wait, and then, yeah. What prevents you from that would be disgusting. <laughs> Don't you think? Seriously. Like if you put fried bacon in to a milkshake. Captain, once you put the peanut butter Captain Crunch in there, it got disgusting. <laughs> okay. I want to be clear that Kevin's pay has just been cut. <laughs> and it's a shame because we're actually not currently paying him. <laughs> He's actually paying him. Okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, you did not make us for death. But you met us in our death and you transformed it into resurrection. And we are eternally grateful for that. For all those who've gone before us, we thank you. Please get them home. And for all who will die today, please comfort their family with peace. We pray for peace in our country. Peace that is a result of a conviction that we all need to change and to accept that change with humility, protect the people who protect us. Oh, we love you and we trust you, amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, tomorrow, El Manana, La Manana, which is Spanish for the Manana. I'll see you tomorrow at noon with Father Ryan Riley, doctor, teacher, theologian, Monsignor, Bishop of Uprick. All right. God bless you guys. See you tomorrow.